Christmas is just round the corner and it's extraordinary to think that it was almost exactly a year ago that I first set foot among these buildings. And what an amazing year it's been. From an unpromising pile of shabby dairy buildings has emerged River Cottage HQ, a hotbed of culinary activity where all my homegrown produce has been transformed into elegant dinners, products for market and celebratory seasonal events. We've reaped the harvest and marked the seasons along the way. And I'd like to think we've fed our guests with the finest food West Dorset has to offer. We've had some good fun doing it too. And of course, I've had a huge amount of help from old friends and new. Without them, I simply couldn't have done it. And it seems fitting to end the year with a party to thank them all. So I'm planning a gluttonous medieval banquet with a spectacularly meaty centrepiece. I'm throwing a Christmas party for everyone who's helped me over the year. And to feed them all in style, I'm ready to take on my biggest culinary challenge yet. An ancient medieval roast. A bird within a bird within a bird. In fact, ten birds in all. And my plumpest goose is going to be the bird of honour. Come on, girls and boys. Since August, when Pammy first brought me my flock, on, I've more or less left them to it. In you go. Now it's time to assess their condition. I'm used to handling chickens, but geese are five times bigger and stronger, and I haven't yet picked one up. Right then. OK. Hold a neck up and then put your arm right round their breast and pick them up. Don't try and grab them like that. Any chance for demonstration? I mean, you have done it before. She's picked what looks like the biggest one, but we need to check that underneath all the fluff and feathers, there's a good weight of meat and that all-important layer of fat. That's plenty on there. Yeah. It's not, not just feather, is it? No. It would be ungentlemanly to ask you to step on the scale. It would, wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> Pammy's minimum stress strategy is to weigh the person, then add the goose. OK, 85.8. Humans come in stones to me, but pigs go in kilos. I've been doing rather well over the summer. I'd be about, Fine I, pig. I'd be about ready for sending on. Absolutely wonderful. Almost a baconer. Yes. Let's see how much difference a goose makes. I've already ordered a 15 kilo oh, organic oh, turkey oh, as the outer goose. bird, and I want a goose of about half that weight for the next bird in. 93.5. That's well over 50... Well, that's nearly 16 and a half-ish pounds. Yeah. Great. That's the second layer sorted. Two down, eight to go. <laughs> to go inside the turkey and goose, I'm looking for eight birds of descending size. I'm hoping a day's shooting will bag me at least a couple more candidates. And tomorrow, a few sporting friends will be joining me in my quest and in exchange for the pick of the bag, I've agreed to provide lunch for all the guns and beaters. My plans for the meal include some of the last rich pickings of the year from the wild larder. Sweet chestnuts. This is one of the best chestnut gathering spots I know. It used to be a plantation, and there's dozens of chestnut trees running through here, but they weren't planted for the nuts, they were planted for the wood for old chestnut palings and fencing. However, they're still very prolific, and there's usually a good haul to be had. Two little ones and a good one. It's a chance to fill my boots with a surprisingly versatile ingredient for the winter kitchen. Chestnuts are good for soups, stuffings, cakes, and, of course, for toasting in front of the fire as those winter nights draw in. Mm. 
and after a thorough trawl of the forest floor, I've got a good couple of kilos to squirrel away. Back at River Cottage HQ, it's time to get serious about meat. It's a pretty good bet that the weather for tomorrow's shoot will be cold and wet. And after trudging through the mud all morning, it's a certainty that the guns and beaters will be ravenously hungry. Some seriously hearty winter fare is in order. I reckon they're going to want meat and lots of it. So I'm going to make a stew with one of my favourite cuts of all, shin of beef. Now the bacon is the perfect complement to the beef. Plenty of lovely fat to lubricate the stew, and the rind, too, brings in plenty of body. And that'll get browned in the frying pan before going into the stew pot. The shin is an extraordinarily hard-working muscle, and all that sinew and connective tissue makes it one of the cheapest cuts. But it's got plenty of character and potential if you treat it right. Some really fussy cooks would take a piece of shin and begin a process of endless trimming. My approach is the complete opposite. I don't trim it at all. I just cut it into nice big chunks and let a really long, slow cook melt it all down to delicious tenderness. The beef then gets browned in the lovely fat left by the bacon. Browning the meat is absolutely essential. And the reason it's important is because it burns the natural sugars on the outside of the meat and create some incredible flavours, which then dissolve into the juices of the stew and give it a real deep hit of beefiness. No stew should be without the holy trinity of stock vegetables. So in go onions, carrots and celery, along with the well-browned shin meat, a couple of litres of good beef stock, some roast tomato puree, and finally, a faggot of herbs, bay, thyme and parsley. The stew will simmer gently for around three hours, more than enough time to rustle up a luxurious chestnut and chocolate truffle cake. These wild chestnuts are very small and a bit fiddly compared to the enormous plump cultivated ones, but like all wild foods, the flavour's just a little bit more intense. After they've been blanched and peeled, 250 grams of the chestnuts are simmered in 250 mils of milk until completely tender. 250 grams of the very best dark chocolate is gently melted with an equal quantity of unsalted butter. Four fresh eggs are separated and the yolks are creamed with 125 grams of caster sugar. This is a flourless cake, dense and fudgy, so the only starch comes from the chestnuts, which are mashed into a rough puree with the milk. The separated egg whites are whisked until stiff and then gently folded in to the rest of the combined ingredients. This unctuous chocolate goo goes into a tin to be baked in a moderate oven for half an hour. And I reckon it's time for a drink. I may have just nailed a stew and a cake for tomorrow's shooting lunch, but with a ten-bird roast and the full range of medieval trimmings to sort, I feel like my Christmas culinary adventure has hardly started. For my Christmas medieval feast, I'm planning a spectacular centrepiece. The ten-bird roast is a goose stuffed inside a turkey and a further eight birds stuffed inside of that. I've still got to source the remaining eight birds, so I've organised a pre-Christmas shoot in the picturesque valley known locally as Smoky Hole. As predicted, it's a soggy old day, but nobody seems to mind. Dead secret, is it? Thanks all for coming. Um, there's a slight gastronomic ulterior motive, uh, as far as I'm concerned, for today's shoot. I have a particular, very special dish in mind, which is a, a Christmas multi-bird roast. Uh, a bird inside a bird inside a bird. And I haven't found a nice, tasty little bird to go in the middle. And I've got a, as a little motivator, this is a <laughs> bottle of four-year-old River Cottage Slow Gin. 
it's going to go to the person who shoots the smallest, smallest bird for today. <laughs> hey, burn the gun. <laughs> Provided, of course, that it is legal game and edible. We should manage to bag a few pheasants, but I'm really hoping for a selection of different game birds for the roast. And a woodcock, one of the smallest and most delicious of all game birds, would be the icing on the cake. On the first drive, Dolly and I are with the beaters, and it's not long before we've flushed out a few pheasants over the guns in the valley below. After the first drive, we've a couple of pheasants in the bag, but there's not much sign of anything else. Good girl. Walking up the hedgerows and on through the wood should give us a better chance of a pigeon or even the elusive woodcock. But there's just another brace of pheasants for sharpshooter Anthony. Here, here. Good boy. Dead. When we break for a mid-morning snack, we've got a dozen pheasants, but nothing else. I'm hoping some hot bullshot and a slab of chocolate and chestnut truffle cake will bring out the best in my guns. <laughs> I'm saying there should be more air in my cake. Some of Chris sat on it really myself and flattened it. <laughs> oh, well, it tastes good anyway. <laughs> I'll plug that cap. You're going to have a turkey rather than a goose? Well, we're going to have a goose inside the You're turkey. Have a goose inside the turkey. <laughs> <laughs> OK, then, everybody, you ready to go? Suitably refreshed, it's my turn to join the guns for the third and final foray into the cops at the far end of the valley. And after a couple of loose shots, I even managed to bag a bird myself. Just when the day is almost over, someone shouts woodcock on the other side of the hedge. But when I get through, all I can see is another pheasant being picked up. So what happened? Did anyone get any of those woodcock? Um, Derek? I've taken your uh, bottle of slow gin off you. I think you probably have. <laughs> well done. Just about my favourite game bird to eat. Delicious. And that's oh, not well. all. And a pigeon. I think the woodcock's ever so slightly smaller than the pigeon, isn't it? Yeah. Be a tight fit, wouldn't it? Well, we're well on the way. With the final tally at 21 pheasants, a woodcock and a pigeon, I've got three more birds to go into my roast, and all the guns have a brace of pheasants to take home for the pot. There's just the vital job of reheating and refueling to do. Luckily, there's a roaring fire on the go in the shooting hut. And I reckon my slow-cooked shin of beef is the perfect antidote to dark December drizzle. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you, everyone, but uh, I just wanted to make a little presentation uh, for the bird of the day, at least as far as the cook is concerned. Derek, a woodcock. A fine middle bird for my medieval multi-bird roast. Great shooting and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ed. Thank you. Back home on the farm, the livestock are now on their winter feed regime. The cows get plenty of hay to supplement their diminishing grazing and Bernie gives the flock their winter sheep nuts. There's no more pigs to feed, though. My two best sows have been sent to the boar and my last bacon has gone to slaughter. Having recently killed a pig, I've got plenty of porky delights to supply my medieval banquet, including a couple of enormous hams. But while I've got the modern technology for keeping them cold, what I'm lacking is the traditional old-fashioned technique for preserving and flavouring them. I don't have a proper smoker. The plan is to sort that out today. Smoke is one of the oldest ways to preserve meat and fish and certainly predates medieval times. 
Usually the flesh in question is first salted or cured. Then it's either hot smoked, which actually cooks it, or cold smoked, which is more about preserving and flavouring it. Just a few miles from River Cottage HQ, Ed Found is practising both arts in his traditional brick kilns. I'm hoping to learn a few more tricks of the trade. Thank you. I'm also hoping Ed will help me build a smoker of my own. So this is wild boar, is it? Yeah, this is local wild boar, which we've dry cured with a blend of juniper, sage and thyme with that. And then we're just going to cold smoke it for about a week. A week? A week. Really? It's a week. Yeah, and it'll be rather like sort of parma ham with a sort of smoky flavour. Nice. Compared. This looks more porky. Is that that's your regular belly, is it? Yeah, that's, a, that's um, our dry cured bacon. It's got a lovely colour, isn't it? The smoke in the cold smoker is kept at about room temperature, whereas a hot smoker works more like an oven. The food is placed directly above the fire and the temperature's kept at around 120 degrees to slowly cook the food while it smokes. So, Ed, when you decide to hot smoke something rather than cold smoking, what, what leads you to that decision? Um, it's really two different products you're looking for. Um, salmon is raw and it's cold smoked, so you're just using the antiseptic preservative qualities of the smoke. Chicken and duck are obviously things which you'd want to hot smoke. It's really better to, to have it cooked. How long does the hot smoking take? This will take about two to three hours. Just about long enough for you to come and help me build a smoker. Yes, I thought you were going to get at that. <laughs> <laughs> Smokers can be improvised from all kinds of things. Dustbins, old fridges, filing cabinets. Ed reckons an old oil can will make a serviceable firebox. We've got some chimney liner to carry and cool the smoke. And for the smoker itself, You've got it. I've blagged an old cider barrel. What about doing our first smoking With using our... the sawdust from the cider barrels? Wonderful. Smells of cider. Delicious. I don't know, but it's definitely quite exciting. <laughs> it's taken just an afternoon to put our smoker together. So do you think we'll get an idea pretty quickly? And as darkness falls, it's the moment of truth. Time to see if our contraption will actually draw smoke. Hey! hey. <laughs> that is smoky. Perfect. Thank you, Ed. Excellent. Congratulations. Well done. Brilliant. I've already set aside a ham for smoking, but I also want to make some edible Christmas goodies that I can hang on the tree. So the plan is to make a selection of edible meat-based baubles for the Christmas tree. Sausagey salami type things. We could cold smoke some of them now, or you could run back to yours and we could hot smoke some. I just tried to fling together as many things that felt medieval as I could. I got some dried figs, ginger, a bit of candied peel, plenty of spice. So I've laid it all out, and I just think, grab what, what appeals to you. What do you think, Gil? What are you going to go for? I see there's a big bowl of venison here, which kind yeah. of, I've got my eye on. So what sort of flavours are you thinking of for your venison? Well, I'm thinking orange. Yeah, nice. And uh, some cinnamon. Yeah. Maybe a drop of booze. All spice. And probably some back fat. A little bit of back fat to sort of make it like salami style. Yes, a fruity air dried venison salami. Very original. <laughs> Unique. <laughs> How about you, Ed? What have you got brewing? A pork sausage with some candied fruit peel, with nutmeg, black pepper, and salt. Sounds very good. Mm. Perhaps a little honey as well. A little honey, yeah. I'm going for a boozy, fruity, gingery pork mixture using coarsely chopped preserved ginger, dried figs and some raisins soaked in port. Are you going to weigh, you want to weigh everything into there, do you? Yeah. Sorry, am I talking the scams? Kind of. This is going to be good, this one. Not as good as this, I don't think. And not nearly as good as this one. You've got pork as well. You know, mine smells exactly like Christmas pudding. Right, <laughs> it's the food, is it? Right, uh, in other words, it smells like booze. 
Lovely. It's quite Christmas pudding, isn't it? Yeah. Fantastic. Right, I think mine's just about ready for stuffing, then. Huh? Yeah, me too. Off we go. Okay. A little tiny little one like that is good. Should we just tie that off? Yeah. What do you think, individual baubles or tinsel? I can't wait to christen my new smoker. 24 hours of cold smoke should be good enough for the baubles, but the ham will need about five days, so it should be ready just in time for my medieval feast. My feast is going to need a suitable tipple, so I've asked my friends at the Chiddock Cider Circle to come up with a mulled medieval brew. To my delight, they've gone one better and challenged their rivals from Simmonsbury to a taste-off, one ancient brew versus another. I reckon I could do a lot worse than swipe the winning festive recipe for my banquet. Colin is captain of the home team. For the visitors, Heather's cracking on with her secret recipe. Colin's chosen Chiddock's infamous Manor Gold for his brew. And for authenticity, he's brought some medieval chef's tools. The ginger, is that all right? It certainly has bruised the ginger. <laughs> Half a whole tubs. nutmeg? Yeah. That's a lot Here, of nutmeg. Look at that. The whole outside of it. The whole of the lemon as well. Squeezed in. What's that you're putting in there? That's my one of our secret ingredients, specially made at Simsbury. Crab apple jelly. It is. Ah, <laughs> very cunning. Colin's ancient recipe prescribed something rather more peculiar: egg yolks. Well, that's changed everything, hasn't it? That's a completely different thing now. It, it looks like mushroom soup. It does look like a mushroom soup out of a tin. <laughs> 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 The two festive brews are as ready as they'll ever be, and a blind tasting seems the only fair way to pick a winner. It's the Simmonsbury Sizzler versus the Chiddock Chuckler. Oh, well, they both very good. I think uh, marginally the first one. Oh. Simmonsbury sneaks into an early lead. I think the second one. Simmonsbury. <laughs> but Chiddock's fighting back. Oh, first one. Simmonsbury. Gradually, Simmonsbury pulls away. Second. Simmonsbury. The second one, I think. Simmonsbury. With the score at nine votes to four, my vote can hardly influence the result. Are you ready? Well, I think so. Can you see? Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, no. But it would be nice to salvage some pride for the home brew. That's number one. Hmm. Number one for me. Simmons Brew. Uh, oh! <laughs> right. I got changed pages. Are you sure about that? Yeah. <laughs> well, there's no getting away from it. It's a damn fine brew. Well done, Heather. <laughs> Heather's Simmons Brew Sizzler will make a fine beverage for my medieval feast. I'm ready to call it a day, but it would appear that Colin and his friends have other plans. Apparently, their whole cider-making future is at stake. We're off to the Chiddock Orchard to do a spot of wassailing. Choose the devil's egg. This ancient ritual is intended to rid the trees of evil spirits and so ensure an abundant apple crop for the following year. The oldest tree is selected to become the apple tree man, guardian of the orchard. Come on, ladies, get your toast and dunk in the bucket and hang it in the trees. Toast soaked in cider is placed in its branches by the ladies to ward off the evil spirit. And knowing the Chiddock brew, it'll probably work. You anoint the tree roots with cider. Cider's then poured at the feet of apple tree man to chance of wassail, Anglo-Saxon for good health.
My Christmas medieval feast at River Cottage HQ is in just three days' time, and it feels like I've still got a million things to do. I've got to put together my multi-bird roast, organise an outing for my key River Cottage staff, and I've got to get on with decorating the barn. There is going to be one major anachronism at my medieval feast. I really wouldn't want to have a Christmas party without one of these. The Christmas tree may be a Victorian festive innovation, but I'm a sucker for them. And here at Wynn's Farm, I'm spoilt for choice. The high ceiling and the barn at River Cottage HQ means I can really indulge. I'm planning to get myself the biggest tree I've ever had. I reckon this one is perfect. Luckily, the River Cottage home team, Cat, Katie and Gil, are all on hand to help me carry the monster inside. As well as my smoked, savoury sausage baubles, I also want some sweet treats to go on the tree. The man to help is my local baker, Aidan Chapman. Hi, Hugh. How are you doing? Good, very good. Yeah, You're good busy already. I am, yeah. We're He's promised to show me how to make medieval gingerbread. Right. So what are the dry ingredients? We've got some stone ground wholemeal flour. Right. Even lumps in there still. So, yeah, so this really could have, <coughs> could have been ground on a medieval stone. Bread crumbs there. But that's authentic for the medieval It is authentic, bread. yeah. Obviously okay. it's going to give it a bit of texture and a nice crunch. Fantastic. Woo! So that's ground that's ginger, ginger, is it? Yeah. And what do you got over here? And this is just a mixed spice. That almost smells alcoholic, actually. Christmas oh, on the brain. Getting in the you. Christmas yeah. spirit already. Yeah. Right. So a big handful of bread crumbs. A bit of ginger. So you're not holding back with the ginger either. Mixed spice. You want it to taste, don't you? Yeah, too right. Okay, so if you could combine all those ingredients. Yeah. Recycling breadcrumbs into biscuits is a nice touch of medieval baker's well thrift, and honey is the authentic sweetener. Should we get one in there? And I've got some eggs to go in there as well, mate. Okay, go for it. Yeah, stick your hands in, give it a good old mush up. There's nothing like getting your fingers in there, is there? No, it's fantastic. Oh, this is gleeful. This is, this is kid stuff. This is Christmas. It feels actually. good, doesn't it? This it does is feel Christmas. good. So if you're trying to combine it into like a ball shape... If you want yeah. to place it on there, we can chill it down for half an hour. Slap in the middle. Lovely. Let's roll it up. So what else could a medieval baker do for my feast, David? In medieval times, I had a trencher loaf. A trencher loaf. Which is actually a big round loaf. Yeah. And you'd cut the top off, which will be the upper crust, and that would go to the Lord of the Manor. Is that where the phrase comes it from? It is the indeed, yes. Yeah, right. Ah, OK. So but who gets the bottom of the loaf? The peasant, basically. The peasant. The peasant, the worker, <laughs> the poor, <laughs> poor people. Right. Well, I shall have to have a few peasants along to my <laughs> feast then, won't I? Right. So we're just going to go for one big round sheet now, is that yeah. right? Yeah. You want to try and get it as, as thin as you can, so it bakes nice and crisp. I'm going slower than you. Practice, you. Otherwise, oh, oh, there's a bit off the end. I'm going to make a mess of it. So that's mine ready. I, I think that's about okay. Grab a cutter and let's start cutting out, mate. Let's get as many shapes as we can. I might go for this reindeer one that, that you bought in actually. That's quite <laughs> fun, isn't it? I think it's meant to be a reindeer. It's quite ambiguous, though, isn't it? It's more like a savage kind of dog, doesn't it? A, a wild medieval yeah, hen. I reckon so. The Beast of Bridport. The Beast of Bridport. Excellent. Aidan's also got a nice line in medieval-style decorative touches for the gingerbread. Got some lovely rose hips here, which we picked today. So these will bake in the oven and keep their colour, will they? Be absolutely fine, yeah. Really? Edible at the end of it? I wouldn't personally eat it, but, I mean, they're not poisonous for you or anything, so yeah. We've got some nice cloves here, which were quite big in medieval times, so I'm told. We're also getting creative with glossy little hemp seeds and slices of apple. Should we load them in? Mm -hmm. These are going to look great on the tree. I think they're going to look fantastic.
Throughout the year at River Cottage HQ, my core team, Kat, Katie and Gil, have been beavering away with hardly a break. And before preparations for the feast reach fever pitch, I want to give them a bit of a treat. So I'm planning an office party with a difference. At Christmas, the shallow waters around Weymouth offer a chance to catch one of our most exotic and tastiest sea creatures. What's in your purple rubber bucket, Katie? I'll tell you, it's a secret, it's for later. It's squid we're after, and the idea is to catch what we can and cook it up on board. Hello, Pat. Pat Carlin is our skipper and guide for the trip. Let's see. And my fishing buddy Paddy's on board too, which always seems to add an element of competition to the proceedings. We don't have to go far before we start squidding, but it seems Katie can't wait to get her lure into action. What's going on in your hair, Katie? I think you've got a bit of a problem there. It's not jewellery, you know. You all right? Pat has been squidding around here since he was a boy, and he's confident he can get us among the cephalopods. Oh! Cat's got one. That is extraordinary. It's stunning. Really beautiful. Too good to eat? No. <laughs> Cat's got another got one. one. Another one. Okay. It's a cuttlefish. Oh. That's unbelievable. That's not so beautiful. <laughs> oh, they are. Well, Kat, if, oh. Which one of them would you prefer to kiss? Um, no, not that one. <laughs> not with those suckers. You prefer to kiss the squid, yeah. right? Bring out the squid. <laughs> it's not long before Katie's also got herself a little yeah. nibble. It's getting really exciting now. Seeing as the girls have got the squid and the men are still behind us now, I quite, kind of quite like that. <laughs> Why is it so red? He's angry. They do show emotions and change colours to their surroundings. You've upset him, Katie. I've <laughs> upset him. <laughs> you upset Paddy, that's for sure. I've got one. Yes. We've got him! Whoa! Look at that! He's also got a look on it, admiration. He's not even looking. I'm sulking. It's a good one. Look at that! Well, that's certainly the biggest squid I've ever caught. But for once, Paddy's empty-handed. Back in Weymouth Harbour, Gil and I have sorted out an onboard barbecue so we can enjoy our catch at its absolute freshest. After scoring the flesh with a diamond pattern, we're dressing the squid with a quick marinade of fresh chopped chilies, garlic and olive oil. Just a minute over fiercely hot charcoal, and the squid's ready. Who's for some tentacles? Cat. Yes, please. Thank you. Got a tentacle there. Don't wait, anybody. Mm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Mm. Sweet. Fantastic day, Pat. Good end. Mm. Very good end. Mm. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks. Merry Christmas. Cheers. There's just 24 hours to go before my medieval Christmas banquet, and our gluttonous multi-bird roast still needs to be prepared. With a bit of help from my friends, I've managed to acquire the full ten birds. Woodcock, partridge, pigeon, pheasant, guinea fowl, mallard, chicken, Aylesbury duck and goose, all inside a monster turkey. To pull this off, I need expert help, so I've got in my meat maestro, Ray, to guide us through. Well, how come you've got the easy one then, Hugh? Do you reckon the pigeon's the easy one, is it? The easiest there are. It's just what came to hand, wasn't it? Yeah. The outer bird is a whopping 15 kilo organic turkey. To fit the other nine birds inside it and make for easy carving, they'll all need to be carefully boned out. But Ray's first challenge is to remove the troublesome leg tendons from the turkey. Ah! 
The skill of boning is to trim out the entire skeleton while keeping the flesh and skin intact. There There's the pigeon. There we go. Only the drumsticks and wings will be left on the turkey to help it keep its shape. Here we are. Ooh, wow. Did you ever think about being a brain surgeon? <laughs> <laughs> it's getting enough brains to practice on it. Practice makes perfect. We can have a go on gills if you like. <laughs> All ten birds are boned out and ready to go. Good. Excellent. But before we start to build our giant roast, for extra flavour and moisture, we'll fill all the gaps with a delicious stuffing of minced pork and goose fat, seasoned with herbs and mace. There's just the little woody... No, the little wood pigeon and the wood, the wood... Even our smallest bird, the woodcock, has room for a little stuffing. Yeah, there we are. But there's no way of knowing if they'll all fit inside the turkey until we try. And then the duck in there... I think you should go that way with the duck, don't you? Yeah. yeah. So, Next who's next? The chicken. The chicken. I think the guinea fowl will have to go up the front. Yeah, exactly. It's still inside it. Eh? Are we going to do yeah, it? Yeah, we will. Is don't that going to join up? Cause we've got too many birds. Pheasant next, please. I think the pheasant's going to have to be wrapped up a bit and tucked in like that. Yeah. Woodcock. That is perfect. Look at that. Oh, oh. Isn't it lovely? You know what, though? There's a case for saying the woodcock should be buried right in the middle. Oh, so we should have put him in halfway through. Don't forget, we are on a new frontier. We're going where no man's been before. <laughs> it's like trying to close an overstuffed holiday suitcase. Does it help if we massage it round a bit? After a bit of nip and tuck and some neat work with the needle, finally the legendary ten-bird roast is made flesh. Look at that. I mean, look at the shape of it. Yeah, it's exactly right. Isn't it? Perfect. Right, there we go. We're not the only ones with Christmas on our minds. The kids are on holiday and getting in a festive mood. And Gil and I have promised to take ours to the annual lantern parade at Lyme Regis. Keep going until it gets to the one. We're knocking up some Christmas pudding flapjacks to take along. My boys, Oscar and Freddie, Gil's daughter, Isla, and their friends, Iona and Eliza, are mixing up oats, flour, melted butter and syrup, and a pick and mix of dried fruit and nuts. Just to make it taste of Christmas. A generous splash of brandy adds some grown-up Christmas cheer, and after a thorough mixing, this sticky concoction is so good that some of us can't wait. But if you can hang on for just 20 minutes, the final oven-baked result is completely irresistible. One of West Dorset's Christmas highlights is the Lyme Regis Lantern Parade, a chance for the kids to show off their lantern-making skills and a fundraising opportunity for the town. Christmas flapjacks! With Oscar and Isla rattling the jars, we're hoping our Christmas pudding flapjacks will help to boost their charity coffers. Thank you very much, that's very generous. And uh, help yourself. We've still got a few left, they're going fast. Look at your lovely lanterns, look at that. Well done. Okay. Two, another one. Keep, keep rattling the jar. Right? They seem to be going down a treat. <laughs> Pick the biggest one you can see. Oh, I think you have. Well done. <laughs> You'd like one. Come on, then. We've only got two left. Anyone else for a Christmas flapjack? Yep. It's Go sticky it. fingers all round. And by the time the parade's off, we're all cleaned out. Definitely on the way, and with it, my biggest culinary challenge of the year. My medieval feast is imminent. It's the big 
day, my medieval feast is looming. With 40 guests due in full medieval regalia, I need a feast and a setting fit for a king. My ten-bird roast, at least, is already sizzling quietly in a low oven. Meanwhile, we're decorating our giant tree with edible baubles, both sweet and savoury. We've got Aidan's gingerbread and our various smoked medieval sausages. And it's all topped off with a ginger and lemon star. How's that? Our edible tree is complete. But there's one more major transformation to attend to before I enter the medieval fray, my own. I need a costume and a few pointers in medieval party preparation. I haven't quite decided what my costume is yet. In fact, I was hoping you might give me a bit of a hand with that. Yeah, very good. My herbalist friend, Eleanor Galia, always takes a holistic view of her work and reckons I need the full medieval makeover. Nettle seed, try that. Oh, my goodness, with some vinegar. With some vinegar. It smells like a rather good salad dressing, actually. Yeah, this is an old treatment for dandruff. We've still got the bits in. Oh, right. I imagine dandruff was probably the least of your problems with, with medieval hair. Let me just put it through. Oh, I see. It's sort of like a conditioner, then. Yeah. And then the nettles give lustre and shine to your hair. Oh, right. How do you feel? Does it feel feels quite good? It feels quite, it feels quite tingly, actually. It's quite tingly. It feels quite clean. Which is not something that can often be said about my hair. <laughs> From hair to teeth, Eleanor's mix of salt, alum and barley is apparently an authentic medieval tooth whitener. Just with a finger, do you think? Mm-hmm. OK. Certainly nice. makes the teeth squeak. Nice. <laughs> it's quite good, isn't it? No wonder medieval people ended up with wooden teeth. <laughs> A dab of almond oil for tired cook's hands, a little castor oil for aching eyes, and then it's time for my costume. Just a short. Just a short. Knitted just a short. <laughs> Those <laughs> are quite superb. This actually has a matching bodice. A bodice? <laughs> this way, this way, this way. Look, you... <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, not that's not gonna happen, is it? Because again, we're a bit little, aren't we? I, um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. Gonna have to. <laughs> Actually, great. that kind of works, doesn't it? <laughs> not even oh, that's that. rather fine. Let, let's put this in. Oh, wow, peacock feather. That just sets it off nicely, doesn't it? Doesn't it? I like that. Back at River Cottage HQ, the countdown has started. With just a few hours to go, it's all hands to the pump. My ham has had its five-day dose of smoke and now needs to simmer for three hours. Collins arrived with the medieval rocket fuel. Well, there's enough in there for you and me. What's everyone else going to have? Well... You drink all that lot, you're a good man. Minister. I want a feasting table positively groaning with sumptuous delights. So we're preparing colourful bowls of fruit and nuts. Any more nuts, almonds as well? Why more not? Nuts. A whole roast saddle of venison. And my boiled ham, smothered in honey and mustard, in preparation for a final blast to glaze it in the oven. Of course, a medieval feast wouldn't be complete without a pig's head. But I've already got enough meat for my table, so this one's made of marzipan. Cheer up. Might never happen. Thank you. Special delivery, mate. Wow, it's a medieval baker. Aidan's arrived with his promised trencher breads. He's already filched the upper crust, leaving us with some authentically medieval edible plates. Gravy proof, you think? Well, we shall see. There were no courses at medieval banquets, just a conspicuous display of gluttonous treats, savoury and sweet. To complement my ten-bird roast, there's brawn or jellied pig's head, fantasias of fruit and nuts, a smoked spatchcock sea bass, and pears poached in red wine and cinnamon. 
It's my festive thank you to all the people who've helped me get River Cottage HQ off the ground. Bernie, my ever-dependable stockman, has guided me through the ups and downs of animal husbandry. And Rob, Robin Hood, fantastic. And the underground. Hi there. Hi, Marianne. There's Pat Carlin, who's helped me catch more than my fair share of delicious fish. Good. Cheers. Thank and you. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Hello, Michael. You, how are you? Uh, are you an elf? <laughs> <laughs> and Michael Michaud, sporting an unusual line in medieval headgear, whose earthy skills have helped me produce a bumper veg you're crop. You're a very grubby peasant. <laughs> I know. The Christmas tree nibbles are going down a storm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Though some of the sausage baubles are playing a bit hard to get. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, squires, peasants, etc. Um, please would you find your places at the table and take a seat? It's the culinary climax of an extraordinary year. It's taken two weeks to source the ingredients, a day to prepare, and the best part of a day in the oven. It's time to bring out the mighty multi-bird roast. Looks juicy. Let's go for it anyway. There we go. So far, so cooked. There's a bit of goose. Oh. Bit of goose, Fiona. It's done to a turn, and each of the ten birds is slowly revealed. Alright. That's the turkey. There's the goose. There's the farmyard duck. There's the chicken. There's the mat. Oh, I think that could be a bit of guinea fowl. This is Gil's venison with citrus. I've got a distinct bit of orange peel there. Oh. Can you get that yet? That's rather good. Very good. Don't tell Gil. <laughs> <laughs> the mulled medieval brew seems to be hitting the spot, and in Smoker Ed's case, it's brought on an irresistible urge to go pig sticking. You couldn't wait any longer. It's delicious. Is it good? <laughs> and to round the evening off, some medieval fun and games. Feathers for a knave, oats for a fool, fruit and nuts for providence, and money for all this Yule. <laughs> it's the ultimate Christmas bash. And with most of us now branded as knaves or fools, the medieval revelry will go on long into the night.